Okay, so welcome uh, to everyone for this uh, colloquium uh, organized by the Physics and Astronomy Department of Padova. So today we have actually the pleasure to host the Professor Misao Sasaki. Uh, he's uh, actually the Deputy Director of the uh, Kavli IPMU Institute, the Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe in Tokyo. He's also a staff member of the Center for Gravitational Physics and Quantum Information um, at Kyoto University, at, actually at the Yukawa uh, Institute for Theoretical Physics in Kyoto University. Before leaving actually the word for the colloquium, just let me give a brief introduction. Uh, Professor Masao Sasaki got actually his PhD in Kyoto University, Department of Physics in 1981. Where he, and he stayed actually in Kyoto until uh, 1986. So at Osaka University until 2003. And uh, then he came back to um, Kyoto University, where actually he was the director for five years uh, of the uh, Yukawa Institute for Theoretical Physics. Um, let me uh, also uh, remind uh, uh, among the various uh, awards uh, and, and, and honors that actually he, 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 he received uh, uh, the Ayashi Prize from the Astronomical Society of Japan, the prize for seminal papers from the Physical Society of Japan and also among the others, the Humboldt Research uh, Award. Professor Sasaki actually is nowadays uh, recognized as one of the most uh, uh, renowned cosmologists. Uh, his research and his works range uh, over a wide uh, variety of, of topics uh, from general relativity to early universe uh, and inflation from cosmological uh, gravitational waves to, to observational cosmology. He wrote a lot of seminal papers. I cannot uh, actually fail to mention in particular one, <laughs> which is uh, a very famous review uh, by Kodama and Sasaki about the theory of cosmological perturbations, which I really think uh, uh, helped a multitude of students to understand actually cosmology, uh, including me. And uh, okay, so it is a real pleasure uh, to have you here with us. And today, actually, Professor Sasaki will talk about uh, the possibility that primordial black holes uh, might be candidate for the dark matter of, of the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, well, is it uh, working? Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so it's really my pleasure to come here. This is my first time in Padua, but I, uh, I walked around this town. I, I liked it very much. So I would definitely come back again. But, uh, but today, it's, it's my pleasure to, you know, the uh, Professor Matarese and all the other people gave me a, a chance to give this talk here. And I hope you enjoy it. Uh, there are, well, I, uh, I made it the slide so that it has least equations. I, I guess there might appear a few equations, but uh, which I hope you all understand. And in case you don't understand, just scream or, you know, Raise your hands uh, or anything you want to say. Anyway, so, and, and if you have any questions or comments or objections, whatever you want to say, raise your hands, or even you don't have to raise your hand, you just shout, okay? Then I, I will stop and listen to you. All right, so what is dark matter? Uh, well, uh, as uh, now we, well, uh, this was only maybe last 20 years or so that we started to understand that uh, our universe actually is occupied by unknown things or unknown something. And, and the normal matter like us, you know, which we call uh, in physics, baryonic matter, like protons and neutrons and all these things, which uh, constitutes the uh, nucleus, uh, nucleons, nucle no, nu nuclear matter, yeah, anyway, okay, uh, uh, occupies only 5% of the total energy density of the universe. And the, 
a dominant component is so-called dark energy. Uh, this is completely unknown. Uh, whether it's really some kind of energy or maybe there's some uh, uh, problem with this so-called Einstein uh, general relativity, we, we don't really know. But uh, definitely there's something which uh, makes our universe uh, sort of interesting. <laughs> yes. And now, but but the, since that's that's completely unknown and it's really a future issue, so I, I probably won't touch it. Uh, if I, you have any question, you can ask me, but probably I cannot answer because uh, if I can answer, probably I get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> okay. The, the next one is the dominant the dominant component is dark matter, which is which occupies about twenty five percent, one quarter of uh, our universe, unless uh we we sort of know at least this is kind of matter whether this matter is some elementary particles or something else uh, we don't really know but we we are sure that they uh sort of normal matter in the sense that they feel standard gravity they gravitate and but uh one among among the, so, such a candidate one of the sort of most interesting or interviewing candidates to the black hole. So this sort of, you know, matter which occupies 25% 25 of our universe, maybe actually small, small, tiny black holes. And this is today's topic. Okay, oh yeah, so, so this is today's theme and the black hole is today's topic. Now, so let me just first uh, tell you Actually, then why or where? Where does a, a dark matter hide? I mean, it, when when it is called dark matter, there must be hiding from us somewhere, and which cannot be seen. Uh, well, actually, so so this was become quite clear in the by all these uh, sort of efforts by the uh, uh, astronomers and uh, other cosmologists and all these people that. Now we know that we 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 see a lot of all so-called galaxies, galaxies which contains billions, trillions of uh, stars, and uh, those galaxy we see is actually turned out to be only small part of that galaxy. The uh, total mass of galaxy is dominantly uh, occupied by so-called dark matter, which is surrounding. And, and, and since it is surrounding this galaxy, uh, we call it halo. Actually, it, it, it's not shining, so it is called dark halo. Uh, probably everybody has dark halo. Okay? And, and, uh, and, and this dark halo is approximately 10 times heavier than what we see in, in the, uh, those, uh, by, by eyes, by visual lights. <coughs> so now, so how do we know that uh, there are such uh, dark matter? And, and then here we use the uh, a, a gravitational uh, law or the Newton's gravity. And uh, probably most of you, hopefully that you learned something about the uh, force of gravity, that the <laughs> gravity is a cent how say, central, not centrifugal, right? The force which acts towards the center is the sort of a, a, a radial force, and and if you have a mass, then and the force is proportional to one of r square. Yes, uh, the way r is the radius from the center of this uh, mass, and and uh, there is this famous a uh, sort of Kepler's law in some sense you know, applied to a circular orbit that if you have some mass. And a G is the Newton's constant, of course, and 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 then a GM over R, which is uh, usually a defined as a or called a, a gravitational potential of some uh, potential energy of some some matter, uh, a, a, which a, with with some uh, mass at large m here, and and if you have this mass, and and if you go away from the radius of r then then you find that the velocity uh, which uh, goes around the circular orbit will be given by this v square equals gm over r and which 
means that if you go to the larger radius, the velocity will go down. Huh? Velocity is one of us, will decrease like one of a square root r. However, the, uh, this is the famous sort of one of the examples here. When you see, a, the, this is the radius, and, and this, this is some, some galaxy, and then the uh, vertical axis represents velocity. Uh, if the, all the matter, uh, the, sorry, all the mass contained in the galaxy is from those so luminous part, the bright part of the galaxy, then this velocity curve should go down like one of a square root r, as I said. So this is this dotted line below is the uh, expected curve, while actual observation tells you well it never a uh, decrease actually it starts increase slightly increase 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 in this case never stops so this means that even maybe ten times uh, uh, greater than this radius use the mass total mass of the system is still increasing. So that the velocity square is not decreasing but increasing. So, so this tells you that there must be something, and which is something which is gravity, and that we call dark matter. <laughs> okay. Another thing which is a, uh, which uses the uh, famous Einstein general relativity is a, to uh, a measure this you know dark matter by using so-called gravitational lensing. And gravitational lensing, again, uh, uh, so here is the formula, the, the simple formula. When you have a uh, mass G, and then if you, some object, and then if you go away from that, the radius R, then, and if you see something behind this uh, massive object, then the light uh, is bent by this angle theta. Uh, this is also very, very close to this uh, gravitational potential energy, but divided by this C squared. C is the speed of light. And when you divide it by C squared, this becomes a non-dimensional quantity. And actually it's a very, very small number, but still finite. Uh, and, and, and from here, you see that it, depending on how massive the, the central object is, the uh, angle of this bending angle uh, changes. And, and the, by observing this gravi gravitational lensing effect, you can see how, 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 uh, how much the mass is contained in that radius, okay? And this is exactly seen, for example, in this famous uh, well, lots of such an, uh, figures taken by this uh, uh, Hubble telescope, uh, which is the uh, space telescope. Uh, a, I'm not exactly sure still it's uh, alive or not, but anybody knows. Anyway, it was a, a, 20 years ago, so you know it was in the air, in the, in the space, and they succeeded taking all these very very fine pictures of the uh, deep universe. And this is one of the examples. It, you could see beautiful rings. This is called Einstein ring, because as you could see, this is two-dimensional uh, picture, but if the, uh, the your source, source the, of the light is right exactly behind this massive object, then you will see a circle of, uh, of those uh, images. And this has been discovered. And, and from here, you can uh, estimate how much mass is contained within that radius. And that tells you that there's a lot more than what you see in here, uh, which is bright galaxy. Uh, so, so this is another way to, uh, so uh, of the evidence, evidence that the, there is indeed a dark matter. So you have, Two evidence, actually, uh, oh, by the way, yes, uh, this is a, one, one small kind of advertisement since I'm coming from this uh, Kavli IPMU where uh, there are a 
uh, they are, has a playing a very important role in so-called subal telescope observations, uh, and uh, and where they they have built a huge a, about a uh, I don't know this size of uh, probably one of the largest digital camera, uh, uh, which is called this hyper screen cam, and with this hyper screen cam you can. A measure a very deep universe in a very very a short time scale. So so it's a huge because it's huge. For example, you know you can just within one say a blink of second you can you can measure a very large area of the universe. That's why you know you can take a lots of pictures and from that pictures and and, and analyzing this gravitational lensing effect. Uh, uh, of uh, which uh, which affects the uh, images of uh, distant galaxies, they were able to. Oh, I should say uh, we were huh? <laughs> able to uh, to uh, reconstruct the uh, this dark of the universe on this scale. This is so that's uh, well. If you go to that uh, website, it's it's the uh, our uh, uh, institute's website. You will be able to see this anyway. So. So this is the very recent sort of a, a uh, results, and and they and from which actually we a, was a, able to reduce deduce various so-called cosmological parameters parameters of our universe, how fast our universe is ex expanding, and what's the fraction of energy of dark energy, and so on and so forth. Yes. <clears throat> now. Uh, related to that, the third evidence is so-called structure formation. Uh, well, uh, we think, and, and this is perfectly consistent in, with the various observations, especially so-called cosmic microwave background observation, CMB observation, and uh, uh, which uh, was uh, reported by, uh, which the final result of this was reported by uh, five years ago or so by this Planck, uh, team, uh, Planck team is a European uh, a, a space agency's uh, a project, so probably many of you know this. But anyway, from that, we know that the, our, all these galaxies and stars and all the things, all so we call structures, or uh, when you talk about even the larger scale of those, you know, distribution of the galaxies, we call it large scale structure. But all these large structure came from some very, very tiny, small fluctuations in the density. And those small density fluctuations a, a, a grows to gravitationally grows and, and start to collapse and form all these uh, a, 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 a structures. And actually, after forming those stars and so on, and then for some very nonlinear process, Human being like us, you know, the life is born. So, uh, so everything comes from this small, small, tiny density distributions in the early universe. Anyway, this is known, and we know what was this amplitude of the tiny perturbation was from this uh, CMB observation, which actually, so, uh, so this is the history of the universe. You have some big one. I might be able to talk about this inflationary stage of the universe, which. In the very, very early universe, you, the universe expanded exponentially. Probably I touch it later. But anyway, after that, they all, after the universe expanded exponentially, the whole energy of that universe was turned into hot so, a thermal energy. And, and, and then, so there appears so called hot Big Bang universe. And, and this hot Big Bang universe is. Uh, how say optically thick in the sense that because it's very hot and dense, any photons, for example, is scattered by the a, uh, charged particles, and the, these uh, photons cannot sort of uh, go straight. So it's really a a a, a how say li like those uh, light uh, bubbles. I mean, uh, uh, you know, you, you cannot go see through it. However. After about, uh, this is uh, 380,000 years or so, uh, the universe it, it became sufficiently a, a low energy, a low 
temperature and, and the uh, uh, low energy density that uh, all these freely propagating electrons start to re we call we call recombination they combine with protons so electron and proton recombine to be form a neutral hydrogen and then you lose all these uh, charged particles and then the, the light start propagate freely and this free propagation light is called cosmic microwave background and that was the uh, major sort of uh, evidence that our universe was very hot and dense in the, in the early universe. Now, what we know from the observation of this uh, cosmic ray background and it's sort of fluctuations, because as I said, you, you need a small tiny fluctuations to produce the, the galaxy and so on. And so. It, from the observations, you know that uh, a, a how small the fluctuations uh, of the, this the cosmic background background is at this point, and since this these are electrons which you know interact with our body, you know what, what, what the reason why, for example, we we are not transparent is that all these photons interact with our body so that they are reflected, and that's why you see, you know, the uh, us. So which means that. If a, a normal matter interacts very heavily with electrons and protons and the photons. So if everything was uh, made of normal matter, then this norm amplitude of fluctuation normal matter must be equal to the fluctuations in the CMB at that point. But that is too small to explain the current universe structure. So for some reason, the structure must have started to grow earlier than the time of recall. And this can be possible only if they don't interact with photons. So they must be dark and transparent. So this was a very, very strong evidence. So you have, uh, as I said, you, you have three evidence, one from local, so, you know, the observation of galaxies and, and the, motion of stars. The second, gravitational lensing, which actually measures the amount of mass contained in that, you know, gravitational lensing event radius. And it finally, from the very early universe experiment of CMB and so on and so forth, we, and the theory tells you that we need something which do not interact with photons. Otherwise, we cannot form galaxies in time. And then we want to be here, <laughs> okay? So, 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 so this is the reason why we think uh, that, well, we believe, or we know, it's almost proved that there exists dark matter. Uh, oh, by the way, so this is another kind of uh, a structure formation sort of a picture, which tells you how, you know, how this initially almost homogeneous universe turns into uh, the, uh, this large scale structure. But in any case, so it's, of course, this is just picture, so it's not so easy to tell, but uh, unless you have this dark matter, let's say, as I said, about 25% of dark matter, then all this uh, simulation cannot agree with observational data. Or, or conversely, if you assume that the, uh, 25% of the universe or the most of the universe, matter of the universe is made of dark matter, then simulation agrees perfectly with observational data. Okay, so, so that's what we know. Now, now the um, central question. So what is dark matter? What is it made of? Uh, First of all, uh, so, uh, so as I said, it must be transparent to light. It must not interact with photons. So it must not be the standard baryonic matter. Uh, oh, by the way, so, so, so in this sense, <laughs> maybe it is more appropriate to call it transparent matter rather than dark matter because uh, nothing is dark. I mean, you know, it's just transparent, <laughs> okay? <laughs> But the but, uh, uh, image is probably, you know, since you, 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 when we see something we don't know or we don't see anything, 
then we say it's dark. Huh? So probably that's the reason. For example, uh, the dark matter probably there are lots of dark matter. There could be lots of dark matter in this in this uh, in this room, but uh, since they don't interact with us, we don't see it. That that's quite possible. Okay. Now, of course. <laughs> And there are uh, oh, this uh, hollow formation, blah blah blah. Well, I, again, a, uh, as I said, uh, you you do need to have some kind of dark hollow surrounding galaxy, and and uh, and theoretically you can only explain this uh, uh, if such sort of a heavy matter do not interact, uh, or at least it, that uh, interaction is very weak. And, and so, so uh, the, uh, a, there are several candidates and the most sort of well-known or sort of candidates, so-called WIMPs. This is a abbreviation for weakly interacting massive particles, uh, which probably is some elementary particles, which we don't know yet. And, and there are lots of efforts to, to experiment their efforts to uh, discover such particles. Uh, similarly, uh, now recently, another sort of a, uh, by the way, this, this, we, we are so-called fermions. Uh, fermions are like, like protons and electrons. And, and uh, a, 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 I don't know why, in, in case you know what fermions are, I'm sure you know Fermi, huh? Yes, okay. So, so, uh, uh, yeah, they are, uh, uh, they are the particles which uh, uh, cannot occupy the same sort of a quantum state, and they have this uh, what you call it, exclusion principle, and 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 those are standard particles which occupies our universe. Uh, standard dark matter, I'm, I'm sorry, not dark matter. Standard baryonic matter is mostly made of those uh, fermions, but. There could be bosons, so-called bosons, and very recently, about a few years ago, there was this discovery by uh, this uh, uh, Sands uh, H, what, what was it? <laughs> LHC, huh? yes, <laughs> Large Hadronic Collider, that there was actually some so-called uh, scalar particles, a uh, bosons, which uh, is the source of the origin of the mass of all these particles and so on. So. And, of course, in that, this this is called Higgs particle. Higgs particle is very very heavy, and, and it can never be. I mean, it's unstable, so it can never uh, represent the dark matter of our universe. But uh, you may have some those boson scalar uh, type uh, field or particles which could be the dark matter, and and uh, this is the one of the. Uh, a uh, representative sort of model is is called action field, and this is the reason why it's an action-like particle. It is considered to be a very light particles, and and maybe they are the ones. But as I said, we are now in this uh, uh, talk. I'm uh, interested in, or I'm trying to sort of convince you <laughs> that, of course, because uh, uh, let's say you know, you may make some bet that you know, wimps may be the dark matter or the action-like particles and so on. So, and and I can, all, of course, I mean not with maybe all of you, but with some of you. That meaning that if I bet a bottle of wine with all of you, and if I lose, I uh, lose my fortune. So I cannot do that. Maybe one only one glass each is okay. But anyway, I would uh, like to bet. Maybe within uh, 10 years or so, decade or so, we find evidence that dark matter actually is black holes. And, and oops, something, oh, sorry, this is for some security thing. Huh? <laughs> uh, may, maybe, uh, maybe I should not talk too much about black holes. <laughs> yeah, uh, now, maybe, oops, something's wrong. Okay, now, let me just then uh, I talk a bit about black hole. Uh, probably most of you know what black holes are, but uh, just let me quickly uh, review what it is. So 
Well, as you know, the Einstein's general relativity tells you that the gravity actually is the uh, curvature of uh, the space time or, or the deformation of the space time. And, and, uh, but the uh, space time, of course, can be curved, but there's some maximum curvature beyond which, if you try to curve it too much, uh, essentially you, you end up with so called singularity. But fortunately, this theory, Einstein theory, is interesting that in, in a most natural, I shouldn't maybe say natural, but normal cases, when you curve the, the, uh, the uh, space time very much, before you see the singularity, there appears so called event horizon, and, and, and which sort of a, a, a uh, how to say, a, detach that region of the universe from us. And, 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 and this is black hole. And because it's so completely detached in a sense that no information can come, come out. So which means that if any, any information, light or whatever, uh, you know, once you're in that, you go through that surface, then it, there's sort of point of no return that you never come back. And, and that's, and, and this is sort of a, a picture of uh, such a, a curvature. So for example, in the case of sun, you do have some small a, a deformation of space time, but it's not small, uh, small enough. So it, you, we just feel it's sort of a gravity as using Newton's gravity. Well, if uh, the object becomes so compact, then the curvature may be very strong, but still, you can come back sort of, and this is like a neutron star. Neutron star is very, very compact object. Like when, if you the, uh, make the sun to the radius about 10 kilometers, then that would uh, form a, a neutron star. So it's very small and high density and compact. If you make this even higher, uh, the energy density high of the object higher, then they can, they, they start to gravitational collapse and, 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 they, and they, they stay, that's the end of story. And they, you will have some singularity at the center, but before the singularity forms, uh, actually you have this uh, uh, event horizon appears. Uh, and because of this event horizon, you don't see anything, any uh, information from inside. And, and uh, the size of black hole is very tiny, for example, that this M, M, this is M star is the uh, is mass of sun, which is about two times 10 to 30 kilograms. For that sun, sun actually, uh, probably you know that sun, the radius of sun is 100 times more bigger than the earth. Yes, but if uh, it becomes a black hole, its radius becomes three kilometers, probably smaller than the uh, radius of the part of Earth probably. <laughs> so it's, it's a really, really small, yeah, tiny. And for example, if our Earth becomes a black hole, then the size would be one centimeter. Now, you see, I mean, so, so it may have some very huge mass, but it can be very, very small. If they can be so small, maybe they are dark matter of the universe. Of course, you know, it cannot fly, be flying around in this room. If that happens, we would be <laughs> dead. But, uh, but uh, you know, if it is heavy, then the number density can be very small, right? Right? So, so, so it's sparsely distributed in the universe. And since it's so tiny, you cannot see. So it can be dark matter of the universe. Okay. Now, uh, apart from this dark matter issue, so let me first give you, uh, probably more, many of you know that the evidence that black hole actually exists. And one of the, uh, one, uh, uh, how to say, a uh, important or interesting, or I don't know, a, uh, how we should say, a, uh, a, uh, the discovery was uh, uh, announced a few years ago that uh, this team of uh, astronomers uh, using uh, uh, lots of telescopes all over the world and, and, and using some, some interferometric techniques, uh, they discovered that 
actually a, a this this uh, this M87 is some some galaxy. Actually, I don't know where it is, but uh, yes, it's a huge galaxy. And the center of this M87, there was a huge, massive black hole. As it says, it's like 6.5 times but billion solar mass. Huge. Uh, it's, it's so huge. Now the size is large, that, uh, about 100 AU. 100 AU is the essentially about uh, one AU is the distance between sun and earth. And the hundred is approximately the size of our, what do you call, uh, solar system, yes. And, and so, uh, so the, the, uh, now the black hole size is huge because the mass is so huge. And, and they have found that the evidence that because it's so huge and, and, and any, any sort of matter falling into that a, uh, a black hole, you know, start to shine. I mean, before they, they, once they enter this event horizon, of course you cannot see it, but just before they enter the event horizon, they uh, interact with each other and they emit lights and those lights can be seen like that. And, and this was a very, very a, uh, beautiful evidence that a black hole exists in uh, another almost direct evidence was discovered by this uh, uh, about already seven years ago by this uh, LIGO Vago uh, collaboration, which is the collaboration on the gravitational wave detector uh, uh, collaboration. And, and uh, what they found is that a, they see this from this uh, a observations that they see a gravitational wave signal, which a, a, tells you that it, it was a huge, about 30 solar mass black holes, two 30 solar mass black holes sort of uh, 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 rotating each other. Uh, but uh, because of this huge, uh, I'd say, a uh, uh, gravity, the space time is sort of a, a flag, a being fluctuated by this motion and, and it, it gives rise to so-called gravitational wave. It's the ripples of the, of the space time, which propagate from that a uh, binary a uh, to the earth and this gravitational wave was detected and, and seeing this uh, the pattern of the gravitational wave this it was discovered that this you have this 30 black hole uh, binary which in spiral because the, by losing the energy by uh, gravitational waves and finally merge to form a even bigger approximately 60 solar mass black hole and and this was seen and, uh, and the, uh, the uh, discover, this discovery led to a Nobel Prize again to of, of those people uh, who, who did this work. But anyway, so, so, and in this case, it's about 30 solar So we have some evidence of huge supermass black hole, about 30 solar mass black hole at least. And we don't actually know how they are formed. And maybe they are primordial. There are actually some uh, uh, theories which uh, tells you that maybe they come from a very, very early universe. But that's, of course, it, it, uh, just seeing black hole doesn't tell you whether they come from very early universe. But if you go down a smaller and smaller size of, oh, by the way, yeah, so, so we don't really know the origin, but there's a possibility that if you go down to a smaller, small size, then we know that no astrophysical process can produce black holes. And that sort of a critical size is about solar mass, about the mass of the sun. And, and below this mass of the sun, if we see any evidence of black hole, they must come from very early universe, not by a collapse of a star or anything. This is very known. And the most, a, I say, a probable cause or the origin of those primordial black holes, and I will explain in more detail slightly later, is we think that due to some large fluctuations, which are, again, some large space time fluctuations uh, during this very early universe inflation. <clears throat> Now, let me just briefly talk about this inflation. 
the inflation is a, this exponential expanding stage of the universe, which is called inflation. Uh, and it's driven by a potential energy of some scalar field. As we have discussed, uh, you know, we know at least there exists a scalar field, Higgs field, Higgs boson. So it, now it's quite probable that uh, we, there is some unknown, yet unknown Higgs, Higgs like particles which dominated our universe in the very, very early time. And, and if uh, uh, for some reason the, uh, uh, the, the scalar field reverses very slowly, uh, which can be the case when in the, uh, the, uh, the potential force was uh, very small, then essentially the potential energy itself becomes almost constant, uh, which means the energy is dominated by potential energy and this potential energy is almost constant. Now, here comes this most important equation of today. We are a sort of a, so what it's called freedom equation or Einstein equation uh, uh, applied to cosmology. And, and the point is that this left-hand side, H, uh, 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 that, that describes the expansion rate of the universe. As uh, I write it here, that if you, for example, consider uh, some volume V, arbitrary volume V, V of our universe, and then if you wait a, a small time delta T, then the volume will expand to V plus delta V. Now, this V plus delta V can be written in terms of V parenthesis one times V H delta T. And, and this H, then if, uh, if you equate this equation, you see that in, 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 the, in, in the small time interval of delta T, the volume, relative volume increase is given by three times H. Three is because of our dimensions, three dimensions. So actually, if you consider that length, the length will be expanded by factor of H times delta T. Okay, so anyway, and, and, and the Friedman equation, the Einstein equation tells you that coverage of our space time is given by the energy density of the universe. Uh, if you assume uh, this is so-called Copernican principle, our universe is homogeneous and uh, isotropic, and, and they, so so uh, uh, there's no nothing particular in anywhere. And and uh, from the observation, it tells us that our spatial curvature, curvature in in this three dimension, is very small. So if there are some energy density in our universe. And if the curvature is flat, then the curvature, the, the, uh, the uh, Einstein equation tells you our universe space time must be warped. And if space is not warped, it must be warped in the time direction. And what, what it means that the universe either has to expand or contract. Uh, it turns out the, from the observations, we are not contracting. Fortunately, if we're not contracting, then our uh, we will be very pessimistic, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, so our universe is, so it turns out our universe is expanding and which is consistent with the Einstein equation. And the Einstein equation tells you when there are some energy density, homogeneous and isotropic energy density, that space must expand. Okay, and, and expansion rate is given by the energy density time, uh, this uh, gravitational constant. Ah, uh, anyway, so, so what, this happens that if, if, if the energy density remains constant, then Hubble expansion rate is constant, uh, which, you know, well, this is very easy sort of, uh, if you, instead of delta, you just, if you regard this as the deriv derivative, a uh, yeah, operator, then, then this tells you that uh, this, this, it's a very simple, uh, differential equation and that the volume expand exponentially, like exponential three H T. So, so this is the inflation, and and this we think that we believe, and there are lots of evidence that actually this happened in the very very early universe. Now, what is interesting in this a, a, a exponential expanding universe is that, uh, well, a, a, now now. If you consider the, so the uh, quantum theory, uh, quantum mechanics, then uh, probably most of you learn that the, uh, the quantum mechanics tell you 
that even in the vacuum, you still have some small fluctuation, so-called vacuum fluctuation, uh, which you cannot avoid. This is due to the uncertainty principle. And, and, and uh, 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 well, the, uh, uh, the value of uncertainty principle, I mean, no, sorry, the uh, Hubble, no, not Hubble, Planck, sorry. <laughs> Planck uh, uh, constant is so small, it's, it's the seven times 10 to minus six electron volt second, which means that the, uh, 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 the say energy small energy difference of about 10 to minus 16 electron volt uh, gives rise to small fluctuation in in for example in the time of about one second or or in vice versa if you have some fluctuation in one second and uncertainty in one second it only gives you 10 to minus 16 electron volt which is tiny 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 energy however Ex exponential expansion universe, which was in the early universe, was so fast and so rapid that those tiny fluctuations in the microscope field was stretched. And before they sort of uh, react to become a normal vacuum, you know, the, the, the expansion was so so fast and the just fluctuation was stretched. So so this is sort of a kind of picture. I mean, so you, you if you look at the very, very tiny region. Of the universe, the, there's a lots of fluctuations, like in this fluctuation, maybe in this may be uh, the surface of the ocean uh, fluctuation. And in the case of the ocean, of course, it is fluctuation, it's the time space time dependent, now it's fluctuation. But if this sort of, a, for example, the, uh, the Earth, let's say, expanded exponentially at the, uh, you know, all the sudden, then all these fluctuations do not have time to fluctuate. It, 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 before they want to, uh, to to have some fluctuation means that you have some propagation of wave and and to have propagation of wave you have some causal contact but if the expansion is so fast you lose causal contact which means that all these fluctuations start to freeze and, and, and this freeze or maybe from this uh, uncertain point of view the delta x becomes large and, and delta P becomes zero. P is the momentum, which means that, you know, the, the fluctuation or the fluctuation which propagate. And the propagation property completely is lost and, and frozen on very, very large scale. And this gives rise to the small fluctuations, tiny fluctuation of our universe, and which is the origin of the space-time structure, uh, large scale structure, and the life and everything. So. Uh, so this vacuum fluctuation during inflation is the one which created everything. Now, the point is that all these fluctuations, although uh, a, a, you have some mean amplitude of fluctuation determined by this uncertainty principle, but this, is, uh, this follows so-called probability distribution function and in, in usually the, those fluctuations, for example, in the case of those ocean, in, in usually the, the, the amount, say, height of those amplitude of fluctuation is, let's say, uh, maybe one meter or two meter, whatever. But every once in a while, you know, there might be huge 10 meter high waves huh? can happen. Uh, a very, very, very rare, but such fluctuation can happen. This is what is you know, derived from the this probability distribution argument. And, and so, uh, so this is the picture the, on the right, top right side, I'm drawing this probability distribution say of some variable X, X is something fluctuate and, and mean variable X square, this mean square fluctuation, that's the typical fluctuation amplitude you see. But of course, uh, usually this proposition have so-called tail, and and uh, and if you go to a large X side, it will be exponentially suppressed. But still, you have some finite probability that uh, of that large fluctuation. Now, so of course, I mean, if it is, if this uh, mean fluctuation amplitude is so small, very very tiny, then you wouldn't be able to actually see this tail part. But if it's not too small, then even if that most of the space time 
is not really having any large fluctuation, but some part may have large fluctuation. And those large fluctuation eventually can collapse gravitationally and form black holes. So those are primordial black holes. So, so they simply comes from this fluctuation of the initial vacuum fluctuation. Any question? Yes, okay. All right, so, uh, and, and uh, as I said, in, uh, mentioned in the beginning, uh, in, in this mechanism, there's no, no limit on the mass. Mass can be very heavy or light. And especially, so if those black holes mass is smaller than the mass of the sun, then they must come from those mechanisms that yeah, they must form in the very early universe because there's no physical astrophysical process that produces black hole of such small mass. Okay, now, so now we look for primal black holes. Uh, where can we see it? Again, we use my, uh, gravitational lensing. Of course, uh, you know, we can, since it's so tiny, small, we cannot really see by eye or anything, but it does have a gravity and this gravity is very strong. So, so there's a chance if, if they are uh, this sort of a, a, a primal black hole sort of a, let's say you, you are observing some distant stars and this the black hole just passed through in front of uh, your line of sight. Then this, uh, uh, when, when it passed through, then they are, uh, because of gravitational lensing effect, the uh, brightness of that star suddenly increase and then decrease again as it passed by. And, and since it, this time scale is so short and, and nothing can accelerate towards anything, so you can regard this as a constant velocity phenomena, then you can draw this curve, uh, the third curve, curve very accurately and must be symmetric and you have some particular form and uh, that and it is independent of frequency of light and if you see such event then it must mean that you have some compact object and which are most likely primary black holes so this is called a uh, especially uh, since it's the now you don't see the uh, multiple images or anything so so this is called micro lensing it just brightens up and goes down. And, and they, from this, you can look for uh, a primal black hole. So now, now the, then, then there, this is the uh, observational a, a, uh, result that if you consider black holes of mass, as I say, probably a greater than mass of moon to the larger side of the mass, then essentially the a, a gravitational lensing uh, observation tells you that the primal black hole cannot be dark matter of the universe. The horizontal, uh, on the vertical axis, the fraction of a primal black hole in this dark matter. So if fraction is unity, the, all the dark matter is black hole. If fraction less than unity, maybe there are some primal black holes, but uh, they are not dominant component of dark matter. Now, so for the large mass side, we don't, have anything, but we do have some uh, window here. Uh, and the, the reason of this window actually is that if mass is smaller than, say, uh, the state is smaller than, say, the mass of moon or it's planetesimal or you call a uh, protoplanet, whatever, then size of black hole becomes less than 10 to 5, 10 to 6 centimeter. And that's the optical wavelengths. And, and again, probably most of you learn this uh, effect of diffraction, that when wave or light or whatever, the wave comes, it's propagating. If the uh, uh, object which, uh, uh, is too small, the size of the object is more than the uh, wave length, then actually the wave do not see it and then it just goes through as if that there is no obstacles there. And, and which means that the gravitational lensing then do not happen for those low frequency. That's why there's a huge window. The 
the reason why we have some is lower bound on this window is that the, this is the famous sort of a, uh, theory by Stephen Hawking that the black hole actually can evaporate. And, and the, if you consider this evaporation time scale, the mass of those black holes is just evaporating today. And, and if they are evaporating, they are emitting all possible high energy particles. And it, in particular, the very high gamma ray burst, the gamma ray a, a, a photons. Uh, but since we don't see such gamma ray photons, we can make a very strong constraint on number of those uh, uh, primary black holes. And that's the reason why you have the lower bound. But in any case, you have a very large window, which a, the gravitational lensing cannot detect. So this is a opportunity that uh, maybe black hole, maybe the dark matter of the universe. But then how can we prove this? That's, I mean, you know, it, it's free to say that yeah, it must be primary black holes, but uh, if you cannot prove it, it's meaningless. Now, here comes the interesting effect. Actually, as I said, you have these fluctuations and, and uh, from the uh, inflation in the universe, and only the very rare and large fluctuation becomes black hole. Most of the other fluctuations just decays out. But before they decay out, they oscillate. And these oscillations essentially is a space-time oscillation. They will produce gravitational waves. And it turns out if the primary black hole, let's say of 10 to 20 million gram, which is about uh, just in the middle of this, around this, this, this mass, uh, then associated corresponding frequency uh, of gravitational wave, which are uh, uh, produced from those space-time fluctuations is about 10 to minus three hertz. And this happens to be exactly the frequency band, this uh, so-called LISA project, uh, the space observatory, gravitational wave observatory project is trying to measure. So this means once Lisa flies and start to measure the uh, the uh, so-called gravitational wave background, which are arising from those fluctuations. And if they see it, that's a very strong evidence for this primordial black hole as dark matter theory. While if you don't see any, then it kills this theory. So in any case, the important thing is that you know the, within a 10, 20 years or so, this LISA a, uh, space telescope, gravitational wave telescope, will uh, tell us whether primary black holes are the dark matter of the universe or not. Uh, I hope I will be still alive within <laughs> for the next, uh, for sure you will be, but uh, yeah, so I, I, uh, I try to uh, be healthy enough. Huh? Anyway, so this is, <laughs> I think maybe it's almost time. Uh, anyway, so this is the uh, Lisa, uh, the, uh, some picture of the Lisa. And, and actually a similar uh, uh, project is uh, uh, going on in China. And I don't know which one goes first, but uh, and maybe there are some political things, but I don't care, you know, science doesn't, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the result of science is independent of politics. So, so and, and uh, this just show you, simply show you that the independent of various model of this uh, fluctuations coming from the inflation, we will definitely see a, a uh, signals if the uh, primary black or the, the uh, black uh, dark matter of the universe. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, so primary black holes may be dark matter of the universe. Uh, and uh, because I, we know that the uh, normal matter consists only 5%. 70% we don't know, that's, that's a future issue. Uh, probably some of you may be able to solve it and you get the Nobel Prize, uh, then you can maybe uh, give half of it to me. Uh, then, and the uh, remaining is about one quarter is dark matter and it could be of course, uh, uh, that stand out some unknown 
uh, elementary particles, uh, some uh, bosons and so on and so forth. But there is this another most interesting possibility. Well, we, in fact, as I said, of course, it, you do need some, some, uh, some, uh, some model for the inflation, but whatever the, uh, at least it is true that because of this, uh, you know, some probability distribution function, maybe it's exponential exponents, a small quantity, but there is always a possibility that there is huge, rare, huge uh, 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 yeah, fluctuation. So, so in that sense, if we can explore the entire universe, you know, definitely there must be at least one primal black hole, but uh, that doesn't help much. So, so we, we don't want, uh, we don't, we don't, we want some more and some more can be actually uh, uh, given. I mean, if you consider some not so artificial uh, a model of the inflation, then you can actually produce a, a sufficiently large amount of primal black hole and which could be dark matter. And in that case, as I told you that the LISA observatory will prove or disprove it. And, and uh, so this is, we are actually living in a very, very exciting era. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this very interesting uh, talk, colloquium. So time uh, for questions, especially from the students. Don't be shy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 or yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, so I have a question about uh, observing the primordial black holes. And uh, so is it viable to use the Penrose process to observe uh, primordial black holes? Because presumably they are a kind of a care solution. They must be rotating. They have an ergo region around them. And uh, like particles moving through that ergo region, if they decay, they can gain energy. And if we observe like a flux of high energy particles, which are gaining energy from a source, it can show us that there exists a black hole there. Yes, uh, well, uh, there are several theories and models that they uh, discuss such possibilities, but uh, in most cases, uh, well, Actually, this depends on the history of your universe, but we assume that the history is of the universe is essentially dominated by so-called radiation dominated universe, meaning that it you know, was completely hot and dense universe uh, a, uh, occupied by a relativistic particles. Then a theory tells you that the spin of black hole is very, very small. Yeah, so, so to have a large spin of black holes, you need to have some, in some sense, non-relativistic, very quiet universe, where you, know, you, you, uh, you make it smaller and smaller uh, size, and, and so that the, uh, you know, this is the standard skaters effect, the you, you know, spin becomes higher and higher. And, and if you can have such formation channel, then you may have such a process, but, in the standard sort of a history of the universe, this seems to be quite improbable. That's, that's the reason why we don't really consider this uh, rotating black holes. Okay. I mean, you mean there is improbable that they're rotating or is it they, small? They, it, yeah, so, so their rotation, their spin is very small. So okay. this means that the Penrose process doesn't work. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions?
Um, firstly, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I would like to ask uh, how exactly do you, uh, I didn't quite understand how you prove the existence of dark matter starting from the uh, expansion of the universe. So how do you justify that exactly? Uh, yeah, this is a bit difficult to uh, explain, but as I, I shown here, it's, it's a, so, so it, during this very hot and dense universe, matter cannot collapse because of this uh, photo interaction of photon. When they want to collapse, the photon will uh, 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 so have some pressure against this collapse so that uh, you cannot have any objects, you know, sufficiently a small and compact object like galaxy and so on and so forth. But if our universe is dominated by some unknown dark matter, which do not interact photons, they can dominate our universe before the universe becomes transparent. And, and they start this uh, gravitational contraction starts before this, uh, a, this surface, which is called the last scattering surface. And, and, and so, and, and, and this, if, if you have this, then, then the initial amplitude can be small. Yes, you have enough time if it starts to grow fast earlier, then you have enough time to become a galaxy. Uh, you see, you see, you know, if you fix the initial amplitude, and during the, this uh, you know, hot and radiation dominant universe, this amplitude cannot grow. So, so the only way is to make a growth after this recombination, after the universe becomes transparent to the light. But then that's too late to form a, the, a, 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 those galaxies. Uh, and, 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 and it's inconsistent with the observation of CMB data. So, so that's the reason. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, questions? Other questions? Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, it was very interesting. I have a question about the um, why the black holes wouldn't interact with light if they surround every galaxy and uh, wouldn't they have an, an effect on the magnitude on the apparent magnitude of the observed galaxies yes. or are they small enough where the effect isn't this noticeable is exactly what i uh, about I, this was about gravitational lensing but i talked about here this if they are dark matter their size is less than 10 to 5 centimeter probably 10 to minus 8 centimeters so about the size of atom uh, uh, it's so small and it only interacts with gravity. So photons you know, do not see them. You see, you know, they, they, they just propagate as if there's nothing. Yeah. Is it okay? I mean, yeah. I mean this is the uh, diffraction. Uh, I, uh, yes. <laughs> sure. a, a, which I, I think you learned maybe even at high school. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> or at the university. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Yeah, probably much better way. So, uh, so my explanation is very primitive, but uh, probably you have to land in the more sophisticated way. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? One over there. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I kind of miss where you explain the 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 limit mass of the primordial black hole so if the mass like uh go go beyond like 10 to the minus uh, 10 to the 13 or something it cannot be formed in the late universe like in the slide uh, oh yeah 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 so so this this is well i since i don't have time i i just said this but uh, it, we know how we think we know how stars form and how stars could uh, form black holes and so on and so forth. 
and, and uh, but uh, for if you think of all this sort of uh, use the, our knowledge of physics or particle physics uh, and nuclear physics and all these things and and, and try to uh, say compute the a possibility of the of uh, how to form black holes then mass of black holes cannot be smaller than the mass of the sun. It is, you, you always end up with larger mass object, a larger mass black hole. Okay, but, but that is possible in the uh, primordial yeah, age. Yeah. Yes, it can be anything, yes. And, but if it is too small, they, they evaporate away. And if it is just about this size, then that would be actually seen by gamma ray, which we don't see, that's why we have a very strong constraint. Uh, on a very large side, I didn't have any time to discuss. But again, if if the, you have the very large black holes from the very early universe, when the universe becomes transparent and the photons start propagate, they will be affected by presence of those huge massive black holes, and uh, their spectrum will be deformed. And this deformation spectrum, uh, well, we we currently have no measurement and the measurement tells you that this deformation must be smaller than, I think it was 10 to minus five or something. But anyway, this tells you that black hole cannot be dark matter. If the black hole was such abundantly present in our universe, then the formation of this uh, Planck spectrum should be heavy, so strong that uh, it won't be consistent with the observation. So that's why we do, we have exclude this large mass primal black holes. Okay. Uh, another question. So in the last part of the talk, you uh, you talk about the possible model of inflation that can produce um, sufficient amount of uh, primal dark matter, uh, primal black hole. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not quite convincing because if you um, so, so the primordial fluctuation is Gaussian distributed very closely. And to form primordial black hole, you need just like the tip of the, the tails of the distribution. How is that like sufficient to produce like? Yeah, yeah. So, so if you assume the, uh, let's say, this Gaussian distribution, then you have a, some, a, uh, a, you, you need some amplitude of x square, this mean square. And uh, a, the, according to the standard sort of those PBA primal black hole formation scenario, this amplitude should be about 10 to minus two. So it's small, but fairly large compared to the uh, very large scale structure fluctuation amplitude, which is about 10 to minus nine. So about seven order magnitude larger. Yeah, but on, on very, very small, small scale. Yes. Oops. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask if there was any meaningful chance that uh, these uh, very tiny black holes uh, interacted, for example, uh, I don't know, passing through a star and... Uh... Very good question. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, there is. And, and in fact, so uh, this is another way of, say, a proving, let's say, or they're finding evidence of the existence of primal black holes. And uh, if they, I mean, it's it's... Again, it's not so huge chance, but in some rare chance, uh, in, if it goes through the standards like sun, you don't see anything. But if it goes through very dense star like neutron star, then you will ignite some explosion of neutron star. And, and that could be seen in the observ observation. Uh, but uh, so far we don't see it. Unfortunately, and, they, and they, if you compute ex, expected sort of a rate of such event, unfortunately, it's not so high. But maybe in the future, when we see deep, deep distant universe, we start to see this, then, then maybe, maybe we can actually see it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Could you please come back to the uh, graph with the observational constraints? Uh -huh. Oops. <laughs> 
the other way, no? <laughs> yeah, where was it? Yeah. Yes. So you said that we are waiting for Lisa to fill the window, right? Yeah. To tell us the if the primordial black holes could be dark matter or not. But if like the constraint reveals to be very strong, like up 10 to the minus five. Can we just be happy with the other um, part of the graph, the right part with like 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two? Or we just can say that primordial black holes are not dark matter? Well, that's another very good question. Here, a, 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 we sort of a, a, a assume, tacitly assume that they are, uh, they, sort of a, they are not clustered in the sense that it's, it, they behave just in the same way as a normal dark matter or, you know, or normal things. But if uh, uh, we, don't, we don't really have such a scenario of the inflation, but if this, this inflation model tells you that for some reason they you know, happen to say uh, uh, be born in a very clustered you know, a way, then this actually means that all these observations we do, you know, which is actually using the nearby galaxies, huh? this gravitational lensing events, the, these constraints all come from, for example, this, this biggest constraint, this is from this uh, uh, Subaru's uh, hyper screen, screen camp. Uh, they, this is observations, is observation of the um, Andromeda galaxy. But uh, if they are clustered and they, if they happen to be away from, you know, those clusters happen to be away from the line of sight between us and, and the galaxy, then this constraint doesn't apply. Huh? So, so, so there is such, theoretically, such possibility. Of course, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to uh, say, uh, uh, propose or to construct such a model. Such an inflation model. So, uh, so we, we we think that the, well, maybe order of magnitude could be. I mean, maybe there are some small clustering effects, but that could not sort of uh, give this ten to minus two to one. That's 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 the standard kind of understanding. But you're right. I mean, we don't know. Uh, I mean, it, 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 there may be such theory. Yes. So even though the constraint from Lisa is very, very strong, very, very constraining, the theory of primordial black holes and the research may continue and go on? Well, that's a difficult question. I, I mean, I, I definitely it will slow down. <laughs> and, and then until somebody come up with very, very interesting, nice model that explains why the Lisa could not see it, while black hole could be existing some other place so that you have some other ways to uh, probe the existence of primary black hole, then maybe people will start to work on that again. But, but you know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, just wait, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay, so maybe there is time for a final question. Uh, it it could it could happen that uh, a fraction of dark matter is made out of particles and uh, another fraction is made out of pr pr primordial uh, black holes. Yes. Suppose yes. that no primordial black hole is observed. What would be the basic assumption of your theory, which is wrong? I mean, the question is, what is the the basic assumption of your theory of your theory that you cannot prove theoretically? Ah. Uh, uh, that we can, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if I understand your question, but the point is that here, yeah, as you know, the, this, this model is based on some particular mo kind of inflationary models where the fluctuation in scales observed by CMB and or the large scale structure is very small, while the fluctuations start to become very large towards the end of inflation, which means that it's smaller scale. And, and if you assume such theories, which were models, which is quite sort of common, <laughs> in, you know, you, you can very easily sort of uh, 
construct such model. Although, since we don't have any observation on the, such small scales, we, we don't care. Now we only care about the, at the current observational level about this large scale observation. That's why we don't really touch on that part. But as soon as you try to consider the full, say, scale of uh, inflation, well, uh, as maybe you know that the inflation, we, we think that the, there was at least about 50 number of e-folds, uh, the, uh, the duration of inflation. This, this is like about 30 order of magnitude in length scale. And, and uh, well, as far as we know, I mean, apart from gravity, there's no theory on, you know, a, which is valid for 30 order of magnitude. So, the, the model you assumed at the, say, this very, very long wave, wave length, if you, you know, the extrapolation of that to the end of inflation probably is wrong. And that's why we, we have a very good chance that, you know, you, have, you may have a fairly large fluctuation that produces primary block cost. But of course, if we deny all these, you know, reasons by, <laughs> the, uh, the observations, then uh, we still have some possibility of having primal black hole, but uh, uh, they cannot be dark matter. Yes. Uh, another, the, the first point you mentioned, if it all depends on what they, if they are, the dark matter and primal black hole are not both of, sorry, a, a particles and, and dark black holes are not a dominant component but uh, they coexist, then in that case, depending on the nature of the smart particles, you can give a very strong consent on that uh, black hole because those dark particles can ac actually accumulate onto black hole. Uh, and, and this can you know, give you some signatures. So, so uh, depending on what kind of model you consider, you can have various kinds of constraints. But uh, no constraint so far is definite. That's... Okay, uh, so I would thank, thank again uh, Professor uh, Sasaki for this uh, very interesting colloquium. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.